All right, guys, now before I go too far, I'm going to jump back over to my faculty account here because I've got a new student here, student Timbot. I'm going to show you what I do on my side of things and then we'll come back to the student account so that you can see, uh, you know, uh, the, the new settings that are enabled inside the student account. So this is what I got to do on my side when you create your account. So I'm going to quickly sign out and then I'm going to sign back in with my faculty account here. Boom, there we go. Okay, now I'm gonna head up to my administrators panel and I'm going to take a look at the users. And right down here, I see good old number 18 is student Timbot. And I need to add this person to the Humber organization so that they can collaborate with everybody else who's on here and see the materials that we have to work with. So in order to do that, I am going to head back to my dashboard. I'm going to go to the Humber organization here. And you can see that there's a student group, right? And so I'm going to click on that and I'm going to add a new team member. So I'm going to say student Timbot. There we go. And you'll notice that it's pretty good with the auto completion there on this search. So I'm going to add that team member, right? And if I go back now to Humber, then right here, this last entry is student Timbot. Now you've got a profile area and I would encourage you to customize it a little bit. Go in there and give yourself an avatar picture, you know, something that will distinguish you inside this group here so we can find you more easily. And so you can get to know your other fellow classmates. This is an online course. So anything that you can do to kind of familiarize yourself with each other is gonna be pretty helpful as we go along. So now I've got 13 members in the student group that is part of Humber. And uh, so I'm going to sign out and I'm going to go back to my student account. There we go. Sign in with the student Timbot. There we go. And now you'll notice a difference when I've signed in. I've got my own repository, CPAN202. But if I click on organization, I'm now a part of the Humber organization, right? So this over here, these are my own repositories. When I click on organization, these are repositories that belong to the Humber organization, namely the CPAN 202. So if I click on this, I now have full access to CPAN 202 here, and I can see all the materials week by week, along with the critical path. So that's pretty nicely organized there and good to go. Now this, what we're looking at, basically forms the example of what you are going to be recreating here, okay? So if I click on the week one, you can see here's where that bio, that first assignment is. And if I need details of that assignment, well, here's an assignment MD file right here, boom, okay? And then you'll notice that there's also a little supplementary file here called YXML. And I would encourage you to take a look at that because uh, it gives you some good information about XML, um, you know, why it is useful, uh, the course it has taken over time, because you may, uh, you, you may be asking yourself like, why are we even learning XML when there's newer technologies like JSON, right? And uh, if you just kind of go through this, there's a couple of links as well. Um, for instance, to this Google Trends right here that kind of show you the path that XML has taken over time. So that's just a little bit of supplemental information. And you usually will find some supplemental things like this inside of each week as they go up. So I've got my full access. I can take a look at Professor Timbot, find out who he is, what he's about. And I need to do something similar for my own account here. And by doing so, I'm gonna get used to using Git and I'm gonna learn a little bit about using markup, or uh, sorry, markdown as well. So let me head back to my dashboard. 
And I'm going to go back into that repository that I set up, the CPAN202. And my next task is to basically check out this repository down to my local system so that I can start doing some work in there. And after I've completed that, I'm going to commit it back up into the online repository. And by doing so, this is how I'm going to week by week craft a really nice portfolio of code inside of here for myself. So for to, in order to do that, I'm going to need some software on my local system. You're going to need something called a Git client, which is basically just a small piece of software that you install on your local system. And it's used for syncing back and forth between the remote repository and your local repository. Now I use one called uh, Git SCM or Git bash right here. It's git-scm.com download. And this was created by the folks from GitHub for their community. And it works really well. And you can see that there's versions for Mac, Linux, as well as Windows. I'm on Windows. So I've already downloaded and installed this. It's very straightforward installation. I'm good to go. I've got the client software. All right. So at this point, I'm going to set aside the uh, remote repository here for a moment, and I'm going to jump into my local file system. Uh, so in order to do that, I'm going to bring up the command line. So here's the tool, git bash. That's the one that I've installed from that git scm download. And if I bring that up, we're going to get this cryptic box here. Now, the first thing that you need to understand is that if you're going to be a developer, you are going to have to get used to working in the command line here. Uh, developers never, uh, in, in any you know, serious develop, developer situation, uh, you do not find people using a GUI that much. Um, and this is even more true in the last five years, that the command line is where everything is being done. Now, you don't have to be intimidated by this because I can tell you straight up that if you know, you know, less than 10 commands that you can use inside the command line, you're going to be able to do 90% of what you need to do here. So let me, uh, let me get started here and get you a little bit familiar. Probably the first command that you need to know in the command line is the ls. ls is used to list out all the files in the folder that you're currently in. Right? So I'm here in my local system, and when I do the ls, you can see like there's a bunch of files and folders inside of here. Uh, where am I? Well, if we look right down here, we're going to find there's a link to my documents. So I'm basically at the root of my user account here, and I'm going to go into my documents. Now, how do I do that? We use it. We use the cd command, which stands for change directory. So it's ls for list, cd to change directory. And I'm going to start typing my documents. Now, uh, one tip that I can give you right away is that if you start typing the name of a file or folder and you hit the tab, it will auto-complete it for you. That can save you quite a lot of time. So I'm going to go into my documents. And now I'll do an ls again. But this time, I'm going to use a flag, ls-l. And what that'll do is it'll make sure that the files and folders get listed out in a nice uh, formatted list for me like this. So what I'm looking for inside of here is that highlighted in blue, there's a folder called code projects. So I'm going to go into that as well. Now, obviously, you could set up all these folders using the GUI. You could use the, you know, the, the file explorer, no problem. But it's good for us to practice and get used to the command line way of doing things because you're going to do it over and over and over again, particularly if you work in web development. So I'm going to CD into code projects. I'll do another LS dash L. This time I'm going to add one more flag, which is the dash A. So that stands for show me everything, show me all the files. And the difference is that this will show me hidden files and folders as well, right? Okay, here we go. So you can see uh, I write a lot of code. <laughs> I've got a lot of different projects on the go here. So I have set up a folder called
called Humber Student here. I'm going to go into that Humber Student folder. There we go, and I'll do an ls. And you can see I've already got a folder in here because I was testing this out earlier. So uh, I'm going to create a new folder here. And in order to create a folder from the command line, the command that you want to use is mkdir, make directory. Okay, now this stuff is coming straight out of the Unix world here. So uh, if you learn a few of these commands, you know, you, you're going to be much more impressive. You're going to be up in your game and uh, really blowing the socks off any potential employer here. So let's, let's, let's go there. Let's do that. So I'm going to say make directory and I'll call this, um, you know, second test, just like that. There we go. Now if I ls again, you can see I've got two folders there. So I'm going to change directory into second test. And inside of here, it's empty. So this is where I'm going to check out the repository for my CPAN 202 course here. So now I go back to the online repository. And you'll notice that there's a URL right here. OK, I'm going to click on this URL for the repository. I'm going to copy that URL. You could also click on the little copy button right here. Now you'll notice that you've got two options here. One is HTTPS. And if I click on the second option here, SSH, I get a little bit different looking uh, URL here. Okay. Now the difference is HTTPS is accessed via a, a username and a password. SSH is accessed using a generated private key. Now I am going to show you how to do that because SSH is by far the more secure method for doing this. But to just get ourselves up and running, let's start off with the username password option. So I'm going to cl um, click on the, make sure that I've clicked on the HTTPS and I'm copying this URL. All right. Now I'm going to bring up my little um, Git client again, and I'm inside the folder that I want to copy all of this code into here. And to do it is fairly straightforward. I'm going to say Git. So this is me accessing the Git executable on my system here. I'm going to say Git clone. And then I'm going to right click in order to paste that URL into there. All right, I hit the enter. It reaches out online for me. And because this is a public repository, it's going to allow me to clone it into my local system here. Now, how do I prove that all of this code has been downloaded? Well, if I ls, there's my CPAN 202 folder. And if I change directory into my CPAN 202 folder right here, and I ls again, there's my files. So there's my license and my readme. Now I don't see the git ignore, right? And the reason why is because the git ignore is a hidden file. But we know how to view hidden files, don't we? We say ls dash l dash a to see everything. And when we do, well, there's the git ignore, right? So if you wanted to, you could take a look inside that and see how gitignore files are made. But this should be pretty much ready to go right out of the box here. Now, uh, looking at this, I've got this license. That would be the MIT license that we selected. And we've got the readme. And this is, uh, this is the one that I want to edit right here. OK, so um, at this point, it's good to talk a little bit about the way your workflow works when you are using Git. You can see right now that Git has added in this word master right here, right? You see that? And what that means is that I am working in essentially what would be the live version of this software, this web page that I'm making here. Uh, this is me saying like anything that I do should automatically be made live for everyone to view. Well, that's typically not what you want to do, is it? Instead, the safer thing to do is to work on a copy of things. Once it's up and running and everything is cool and you've checked it and you've done your QA, then you want to make it live, right? 
much, much safer way of working. So the way that Git manages that is by using a branch system. So this master, this is what you would call the trunk, right? This, this live version here. And in order to do some work inside of here, I need to create a branch, which if you think of a tree, it, it, what we're doing is we're basically taking that master or that trunk and we're creating an extension off of it that we will work in when we're finished working and we are good with it and we want to make it live, then we're going to take that and merge it back into the main trunk or the master. Now that may sound a little bit confusing, but in practice, it's fairly straightforward. So the easiest way to, to get up to speed with this is to actually dive in, make a branch, make some changes, and see what the effect is here. So let's do it. So we're going to create our first branch and uh, I want to create my week one branch here. This is where I'm going to gather together all the work that I have uh, done for week one. In order to do that, I'm going to say uh, git checkout dash b. So this is me saying like, I want to take all the code as it is right now and I want to move it into a branch so I can work on it. I can name that branch. So I'm going to call it my week one branch. Oop. Week one branch. And just like that, Git tells me it created a new branch. And you see how this has changed, how it says week one? So I'm no longer working inside the master. So any changes that I make are not going to affect that master until I'm ready. So I'm now free to go ahead and work away inside of my repo here and do my work for week one. So let's see. All right, um, so let's take a look at the class example here so we can sort of see how this should be set up. So I'm gonna go back to my dashboard. I'm going to go to the Humber organization, click into the CPAN 202, and we can see that I've got some folders here including a folder for week one. And when I click into that, this is where my, my bio should be placed. And it's done inside of a markdown file. So we're gonna take a look at a markdown file here. Um, okay, let's see if I can set this up. So I'm here and I'm in the right branch to do my work here. And the first thing I should probably do is another make directory to create that week one folder. There we go. Okay. Now if I ls again, there's my week one folder. And I can go into that week one folder and uh, start creating the markdown file that I need in order to create my bio here. But this is the point where we probably would get away from using the command line. The command line is very, very good for any kind of automations or anything like that. Uh, but you're going to want a, a more serious code editor now that we're getting into actually creating code here. Um, so you can use anything you want. There's sublime text. Uh, you can use notepad if you want. Um, but uh, one of the, the cool code editors that's out there right now that's getting really popular is something called Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Uh, if you want to try that one out, and I do highly recommend it, the reason why I'm recommending that one is because it just works so well in so many different environments. Uh, I can run it on a Raspberry Pi, a little single single board computer, and it runs you know just fine. Not a lot of code editors can say that. Uh, so you're going to be looking for to download Visual Studio Code. Now make sure you have the word code in there because Visual Studio Code is a very different beast from just Visual Studio. Okay, Visual Studio is like the full Microsoft suite, whereas Visual Studio Code is much more lightweight um, uh, option. And uh, that's the one that I'm going to be using here. So if you want to follow along uh, with the way that I'm doing it, then you should feel free. And there's your download link for Visual Studio Code right there. And as you can see, it's also cross-platform Windows, Linux, and Mac. So I would suggest grabbing that. Now I've got that installed. So I'm going to bring it up. 
There's my Visual Studio code. And I'm going to head on over to the correct folder. So if you recall, I was in Code Projects inside of my uh, Humber Student folder. And here's Second Test. So I'm going to select that. And now we are nicely set up to do some work inside of here. So there's my CPAN 202 folder, and there's my week one folder. And I'm going to go ahead and add a markdown file into here. So I'm going to click on the new file. And there's a special name called the readme.md. So this is the default page that is going to uh, come up inside of the online repository. Right, So you notice it's called readme.md. That readme.md is the one that's going to be shown by default when I land here in the browser. So that's what I want. And now I can start doing my bio. Now, Markdown, um, Markdown is a very, very simple way of adding some attractive looking text styling to your documentation. And for that reason, it's become really, really popular in development circles. And just know that um, you can do a heck of a lot in Markdown just using hashtags and uh, asterisks, right? So let's say I want to turn this uh, biography heading here into a nice um, highlighted heading here. My bio goes here. Boom, boom, boom. Um, couple of things. Visual Studio Code has a built-in Markdown Previewer right here. Uh, the second icon on the right says Open Preview on the side. So I'm going to bring up that Previewer. And you can see it pretty much looks exactly the same. But if I go over here, this is where the magic of Markdown comes in. So let's say I add a couple of hashtags ahead of that. And you'll see that how this gets highlighted in blue. And then over here, it's basically turned it into an H2 heading. Pretty cool, right? So it's going to allow you to create really um, you know, attractive, readable documentation very quickly. And I mentioned that you can do a lot with hashtags and asterisks alone. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say I want to do bullets. So I'm just typing regular old asterisks. And you see how they're getting bulleted outside of here? You can also use this for some important thing, right? It allows me to emphasize, add uh, the italics on there. Um, so Markdown is, is a whole thing. There's a ton of great things you can do very simply with Markdown. I'm going to let you use your uh, search kung fu on that one uh, to search out, you know, something like a Markdown cheat sheet. And it'd be cool to see you uh, play around with some of this formatting here because that's going to make you look like a really accomplished developer. Um, so you're going to use this technique in order to create that bio that is going to go into your week one work. All right. Now I'm going to give this a save and you'll see that the little um, small indicator has turned into the X there rather than the round dot. So that file is now saved and it's time for us to head back to the command line here. Uh, now this is going to allow us to see basically how the workflow works when you are uh, using Git here. Now I'm in this week one branch, not the master, and I'll get you to type in this command. We're going to say Git status. What this is doing is telling me that my week one folder is 100% full of changes right here. You see how it's marked in red? Now it's a two-step process for me to say, okay, I'm done working on that new change. I definitely want to add it into my repository. And then once we've done those two steps, we would be able to push those changes up into the remote repository for storing them online and collaborating with anyone else who's working on that repository. All right, so let's, let's just take it step by step here. So the first thing I have to do, and I'm actually being prompted to do it by, by the 
little um, git indicator here. I'm going to say git add week one, just like that. Okay, so this is me uh, doing something called staging. I am basically saying, okay, those changes, yes, those are legitimate changes. I'm done working on it for now, and I want to add it into my local repository in the week one branch here. All right. Now, if I'm finished with that, so I, I would keep doing this add anytime I'm making a change here. But let's just say that I've finished up this bio. I'm happy enough with it. Now it's time for me to commit that change. So I'm going to say git commit. And this is going to take any changes that I've uh, added already. And it's going to commit them into the week one branch here. So the first step is, you know, I'm going to be doing that repeatedly while I'm working. And it's just, it's similar to, you know, when you're saving a, a Photoshop file when you're working away. Uh, you, you just don't want to lose changes if something should happen as you're working, right? That's the equivalent of doing a git add. But now that I'm doing a git commit, this is me saying, okay, all those additions I've been adding up, adding up, adding up, let me now commit them into the week one branch here. So I'm going to say git commit. And I'm going to use the message flag, the dash M, to say that this is my initial commit. And you should always do this kind of documentation as you go, um, because later on, that's going to be really, really useful for you if you are trying to trace back the changes that you've made to a code repository. There we go. So it says one file has changed. It's done eight insertions. That is now fully committed into my week one uh, branch inside the repository. I am ready to take this new branch that I'm working in and push it up online into my online repository. And that would be our next step.